Welcome to Positive Disintegration, a path to authenticity. Today's guest is Patricia Ghetto Walden, and we're going to talk to her about Dabrowski's theory and practice. Patty shares her story of how she discovered Dabrowski and started working with the theory, but what's important in this conversation is how she's applied that theory in working with gifted, highly gifted, and profoundly gifted students and clients. Patty is someone who, in my humble opinion, lives the theory by example, by honouring relationships, holding space for people, valuing emotions, and seeing people as whole people, not just their intellect. Also, she understands how important it is that we all get to our golden core, the true authentic person who we are in our hearts, underneath all the socialisation, trauma, history and insecurities that we carry, and that we get to that golden core through loving, quality relationships and support. On a personal note, the original conversation we had with Patty a few months ago brought tears to my eyes on a few occasions and the same thing happened to me in the editing process. There's something about speaking to someone who is so genuine and authentic and who speaks with so much love, empathy, warmth and honesty that that reminds me of the person I want to work towards becoming. Whether you're gifted, highly sensitive and intense, interested in living your own truth, or you're a therapist or coach looking to see what the theory of positive disintegration looks like in practice, this episode will have something for you. Hi listeners, welcome back to Positive Disintegration Podcast. I'm your host, Emma Nicholson, and with me is co-host, Dr. Chris Wells. Hi, Chris. Hi, Emma. Good to see you again. You too. I'm excited to have our guest today because it's someone who works with the gifted, highly gifted, and profoundly gifted. So I think this is going to be an interesting conversation. I agree. I'm really excited to have her with us today. So for our listeners, our guest is Patricia Gatto walden Patty is a nationally recognized licensed psychologist and author of the book, Embracing the Whole Gifted Self. She's provided counseling services over the last 40 years to gifted, highly gifted and profoundly gifted children, adolescents, adults and families. Patty works on the basis that home life, education and counseling of the gifted must take into account the whole self, the intellect, emotions, physical and spiritual and social selves. Welcome to the podcast, Patty. Thank you. I'm really glad to be here. I'm excited. We're so glad to have you with us. I know you through Michael. You know, it's because of him that we connected. And one of the things that isn't in your bio, but is true about you, is that you're one of the the creators of UNASA. And so that's actually how we met for the first time. And, you know, we've had Stephanie Tolan as a guest. And I talked about how I met her the day that I picked you guys up at the airport and gave Michael and Steph a ride with me. And so, yeah, it's been such a blessing in my life, you know, through my connection with Michael to feel like I'm a part of his family of sorts, because, I mean, that really is how it has felt to me, like I've been able to become a part of this extended family of people in the field who care about giftedness and Dabrowski's theory. And so thanks so much for joining us on the podcast. I'm really thrilled. And I remember the day clearly, Chris, (laughs) you drove us and you were so shy. You could barely talk you. And then finally you said, I'm a nervous wreck. I'm a nervous wreck. (laughs) And because you were in the presence of Michael specifically at that point. And, and, uh, but over time we've gotten to know each other. It's been wonderful. It's, I'm very glad to be with you. Thanks for inviting me what we always do to kick it off. And so we'll do it with you too, is to ask you how you first learned about Dabrowski's theory. I have a great story that you know about. I was getting a PhD in counseling and educational psychology at the University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana, the big university. And there was this new visiting professor in the department. And I heard he was absolutely brilliant. And, you know, I had taken all these other professors and I thought, oh, gosh, I want to take his course. And it was on theories. And I can't remember the whole title, but I remember it being different theories. Okay, And it was Michael Piofsky. 
And so I met Michael as my professor in 1979. The story goes on from there, but how I was uh, introduced to Dabrowski was through that course, a graduate level PhD course, where he introduced Dabrowski. And I remember thinking, this is so difficult. This is so complicated. I mean, I just remember thinking that it was the most complicated theory that I had heard about, you know, and he knew it from the inside out. He knew it very, very well. And then along with Dabrowski, he also brought in Maslow. And those two theories and ways of being, um, and then Rogers, which we also talked about, really became the foundation for me of my entire progression for really 36 years or whatever. So uh, we started out as him being the professor. I graduated with a PhD in 82. And then we didn't see each other for a couple of years. But um, then we were at a conference and he saw me. I didn't even see him. It was at a, I think it may have been at the the International Con- Congress. And he came up and said, Patty, Patty. And oh my gosh. And I think that was like 86 or something like that. And we reconnected and became very dear friends. And Michael is one of my heart, heart throb, dearest friends. And I think you're correct when you say that you are in Michael's family, because I would, I would say that um, we're near and dear to each other. And there are others from Yanasa, including Stephanie, et cetera, that so, so that love Michael and he loves us. So I met Dabrowski through Michael and then reacquainted more as we got more and more involved in Yanasa and planning Yanasa and talking about it. I just remembered something interesting about you. Didn't you um, get to study with Carl Rogers too? Yes, I did. Yes. So after I uh, after I got my master's, before I met Michael, actually, I got my master's in one year and uh, I had heard of Rogers and I knew about him because I'd studied the counseling theorist, right? And he was the one that out of all of them that I just felt that's that's who I am. I felt like I was reading who I was. And so I wrote, I was very poor, <laughs> a graduate student making less than $5,000 and living on it each year. And uh, I wrote, and he was going to be all summer doing an institute at the Center for Study of the of the Person, which is his institute in La Jolla at that time. And I asked if I could come study with him. And I just told him my situation. You know, I told him how I loved him and et cetera. And they wrote back and said, yes, I could be the person who carried everything for him, you know, for the whole, like for a month. And so I got to study with him and Ram Das and uh, the Polsters, who were the head of Gestalt Therapy at the time, Miriam and Irving Polster. He had those two guests. And I was with him every day, all day long. And it was wonderful. <laughs> it was wonderful. Yeah, That's amazing. Yeah, it was. So it, it tells us that say your truth and ask, because maybe the answer will be yes. You know, I mean, they sort of took pity on me. I mean, it was expensive. It was like a month thing. I couldn't afford any of that. But I got to be the person that was with him more than anybody. Wow. That's so cool. Yeah, it is cool. (laughs) Yeah. Very fortunate. I can't help but wonder, how did you end up working with the gifted? Thinking in time of, you know, when you were getting to know Michael and were his student. I mean, that's when he was just establishing himself in the gifted field, too. So it would have been 78. I was uh, at that point had a TA. I was a TA in the department, and I was training other counselors because they liked my counseling skills. And so, I was at that point a PhD student, and they asked me to train the other counselors to be the supervisor. And this professor came up to me who I'd never seen. His name was Bill Foster, and he said, "Would you be the director of guidance and counseling at University High School?" And I said, how much does it pay? (laughs) Because that's what mattered at that point. And he told me, and it was more, it was a two thirds position. And I said, I have no idea what university high school is. He said, it's a school for the profoundly gifted affiliated with the College of Education at the University of Illinois. It's in the top 25 in the nation. It has been since its origin. I'd never heard of it. And it collapsed sixth, seventh and eighth grade 
and senior, a senior, then freshman, junior, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. So it was a five year program. And I said, I'll go over and check it out. And I literally went over. He was the director of guidance and counseling. I went over to meet him. And I this is a very true statement. I fell in love. I fell in love with the kids. They were all over the floor. It was a mess. Everything was a mess. All their stuff was all over the floor. They were laying on the floor. They were, I mean, it was the most casual, free atmosphere. And the kids were just so authentic and real. And I started talking to them. And he wanted me to be the director of counseling. He maintained director of guidance. And he brought me into NAGC way back then. We started presenting together. And then he left and I became the director of guidance and counseling. So I did that for three years. So I entered the field with profoundly gifted. And we're talking truly the 99.99 percentile in all subjects. Harvard came to the school. Stanford came to the school to recruit the kids. They didn't have to go there. Um, And so it's a very highly esteemed, which I knew nothing about. But from the very beginning, I just fell in love and I never left. I never left that field. I just found my home and that was it. So then when I met Michael, it was perfect because I was already there. And so we did. And then when he's talking about Dabrowski and he's talking about that, I was like, oh, my gosh. You know, I mean, it just all just coalesced perfectly. Wow. It's it's how things happen. Synchronicity, you know, meant to be things that I had I had no control over. It just literally happened to me one day. And everything evolved. My whole life evolved. And to this day, I am just as happy as I was then working with this population. I absolutely love it. People say, aren't you going to retire? I'm like, no, I, I, not now. I, mean, I love what I do. So why would I retire? That makes sense. I mean, if you love what you do, it doesn't feel like work. So No, I love what I do. It's very intimate. And as gifted people, I did my dissertation on profoundly gifted. And one of the things was, uh, give me your five most important goals. And out of 280 kids, I think it was something like 95% said, I want to make a difference in the world. And you really do. You know, you want to make a difference. And in this position, in this job, working intimately with people, I know that I can make a difference in their life by being in a loving, caring relationship with them and supporting them. And that matters to me a lot. That's wonderful. My brain, like I, there's a couple different paths we could take with this. And I really want to talk with you about, about this population that you work with, because it's hard to even like, I'm trying to think of the words to do this, because I'm not trying to be political or cause trouble. But I mean, the fact is, in the field of gifted education, there's a lack of understanding about what it means to be gifted outside of the classroom. It's so education focused that it leaves behind the inner experience of giftedness almost altogether to some degree. I mean, I guess I'm shocked every time at NAGC how few sessions there are for the highly and profoundly gifted or about the experience of giftedness at all. And so one of the reasons why I wanted you to come on the podcast is to talk about this population from your view as somebody who has worked with them for decades. And so what can you tell us about this population that we need to know and that our listeners need to hear? You know, I am ardently as a person and as a professional holistic. And that's what my book is about. My book is very, very short and it's very concise. And it's about the innate characteristics of giftedness, what you're born with, who you're born with and what you die with, right? And holistic means exactly what you had said in my intro, which is you cannot separate the mind from the emotions, from the body, from the I put together the ethics, morals, and spirituality and the social self. We are a complex package. And every single aspect, every single breath affects each other. They are, it's just superficial that people talk about intellect or they put other things on uh, uh, on a shelf thinking that they can separate themselves. We do that just because the complexity can be so overwhelming. But I will tell you from the very beginning, and I was back in the day when holistic was never talked about. I mean, that wasn't even, that word wasn't even used. Okay. So I, I probably didn't use it either. But uh, 
I remember being with the kids at, at university high school way back in the beginning. And it was their emotion. It, I mean, they were genius level brilliant, right? They didn't need me <laughs> to help them figure anything out. They were going to do that on their own. What they needed was somebody who felt them, who listened with my eyes, my heart, my body, my spirit. They needed to be a whole person. They needed to be more than their mind. They have wonderful minds, but they're more than their mind. And so for the first time, I mean, over and over again, oh, I mean, it was packed. My office was so packed that they put a sign on it saying the love room. I'll never forget walking there and they called it the love room, put a sign. And it was like the hangout place because they could be who they were. And back then, Chris, in response to what you're saying in the field, I remember that I was an administrator as a director and I had to give a presentation and I was giving it to the parents and the teachers. And you're talking that elite school, you're talking very famous people, you know, the the adults, the, the parents were famous, right? And the teachers were professors from the university, largely. Um, and uh, I remember some of them walking out on my presentation because I was talking about the whole child and the importance of embracing all of who they are. So I guess to me, there's nothing more important. And, and if people could see me when I'm showing you, than to hold people in my hands, like in a safe haven of acceptance and attention and respect and listen and feel and intuit and respond to their individuality, to their uniqueness. So um, I will say to you that giftedness, as you know, and I imagine everybody who's listening knows there's not one size that fits all giftedness. That's just absolutely not true. And while I'm specifying the importance of individuality, I also very much give a lot of presentations, particularly to teachers, of differentiating across the spectrum of giftedness. So differentiating from moderate to highly, to exceptionally, to profoundly, because there are temperament and personality clusters that seem to overlap, okay? And I, you've, you've heard this, I imagine, Chris, you've heard me talk numerous times, so I imagine you've heard this metaphor, but I'm going to say it now because I think it's very helpful as I go on and talk about the characteristics specifically. If everybody, everybody was a television set, okay, and you had the bell-shaped curve and we're talking about, we're differentiating according to intelligence right now, but we're also responding to the whole person. So as I talk, I'm not just saying that this applies to their mind. I'm saying it applies to their emotions, their physical being, their social self, et cetera, and spiritual self. So if everybody was a television set and you have the mean of the bell-shaped curve, the average, you're going to say that those people have 10 to 50 channels to their television set, which means they take in 50 channels or 10 and they put out 50 channels. And they do that emotionally, physically, spiritually, ethically, morally. Now, that's a horrible reduction of individuality, but I'm just trying to make a point, okay? When you go two more standard deviations beyond that, you're at the moderately gifted. And now they're cable television sets. They have 400 channels and there's no off switch. Never. Every breath, every thought, every emotion has approximately, the individuality varies it, 400 channels. The differences of the channels intellectually come in subject matter of interest, talent, passion, et cetera, okay? But emotionally, generally speaking, generally speaking, they are much more sensitive, much more perceptive than 50 channels. They ask more questions. They care more. You know, they, they trust themselves more. They respond quicker, et cetera. That's the moderately gifted. When you go one more standard deviation, it's not additive. It's exponential. They are now satellite dishes. A satellite dish has 8,000 to 10,000 channels. That is very, very different indeed than 300 or 500 channels of moderately gifted. This is why when you go to highly gifted, those individuals of all ages from when they are little, you can see, I can see it in an infant. The difference, the intensity of focus, the the you know the vibrancy of what they're looking at—you can see them comprehending things and not being able to move their body, et cetera. 
Um, the difference of a highly gifted to a moderately gifted is marked so that a highly gifted person is much more detail oriented. They perceive, just think of eight to 10,000 channels every breath. And if you think about it as a wind gust, that's a lot of wind coming in, right? That is a lot to deal with. So they have constant influx of very, very quick thinking, multitude of thoughts, details, wanting every single speck of information, which is why they go very deeply into subject areas that they care about until it's saturated. Once it's saturated, they're done. Don't pick up, go over here to now where am I interested in? They want to be at the helm of their learning. They are naturally curious. It isn't something that you have to, if they're not motivated, there's something going on. They aren't interested or they already know the material because they naturally want full gestalt of information. But they don't like to be told what to do, what to think, how to do it, because they have so much inside information, so much emotional sensitivity and insight, so much morals and ethics that they question things. They don't assume authority is correct. They trust themselves implicitly. So one of the greatest vulnerabilities, I just had it today, I do marital counseling as well, two highly gifted people. They trust themselves implicitly. He's right, she's right, he's right, she's right. You know, they have all it's one of the vulnerabilities because you trust yourself so much because you have so much information. And so a highly gifted person is usually very private. They don't talk about themselves very much. They're very introspective. They're very aware of what's going on around them. Um, you know, they 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 like to be challenged with new ideas, new thoughts. They like to explore on their own. Now, I in this presentation 25, 30 years ago that I was using this metaphor, I didn't know how to go on because I'm not higher than I gift. I said, I don't know what to do. And this man raised his hand and he said, I know how it can go on. We are the the profoundly gifted are Hubble telescopes. And I said, oh, my, I happened to end up working with this man and his family later on, the kids. And and I said, oh, you know, Dr. Jones, that's amazing. You know, you get to see everything. He said, oh, no, no, Patty. Yeah, we do that. But no, we see what others don't know exists. So when I worked with him, a profoundly gifted man, and then eventually his kids to try to find some educational means for them. I remember saying to him, because he's in a think tank, an international traveling think tank, I said, oh, Dr. Jones, whatever I just called him, you think so out of the box. And he looked at me and he said, what box? And that was the perfect response. People that, and I have a lot of profoundly gifted clients. I have a lot of adults that are profoundly gifted that work with me. They see minimally 50 years in advance, 100 years in advance. They can project way out and people think they're crazy, even in their field. And so things take years to catch up with what they can imagine, with what they know to be true, with how they can synthesize and dissect and come up with new concepts. It is a very different person when you go to a Hubble telescope than even a satellite dish. Therefore, in the educational system, how do these kids fit in, right? And the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. So if you have profoundly gifted parents, the odds are you have at least highly gifted kids. And then we have what teachers call behavior problems. Oh, they're too arrogant. They take control. They won't do their homework. They correct me when I'm wrong. When really, it's just the person who loves detail, loves loves diving into things and learning. Um, I'd like to give this, well, there's so many clinical examples I could give you, but this this happened to me decades ago now. I was still at the University of Illinois. I mean, I was a, I was a psychologist, but I was in the area and I had a private practice. And this man walked in and he had a science magazine and he held up the magazine and his name was on the cover and it was his achievement. And I said, oh, doctor, such and such, congratulations. That's just amazing. How does it feel? How do you feel? And he said, empty. He had spent 30 years. And I said, do you mean you're not happy with the accomplishment? You're not happy with that? And he said, oh, no, I'm very happy. I love my work. I still love it. He's got a huge lab under him, is, you know, entitled and all this kind of stuff. You know, wonderful, wonderful, brilliant person, great people working with him. 
great contributions in his field. He said, that's all I am. I ha- I'm nothing. I don't know anything else about me. He came to me because he was not a whole person. He was a mind. He had functioned in life, got notoriety, justifiably so, with his brilliance. He made lots of performance and contributions, wonderful things. He loved it. And still, I don't know if he's alive now or not, but it was really wonderful. But he had a marriage that was falling apart. He wasn't close to his son. He had no friends that weren't colleagues. He was quite a bit overweight and felt like he couldn't sleep. He had high anxiety. As far as morals and ethics, I mean, he didn't even deal with anything. His emotions, he told me, I just tell him to be quiet because I've got to work. You know, so he was treating himself like a robot. And when he got to the pinnacle and there wasn't, you know, I mean, like he reached it, you know, he reached his goal of life. It was like, whoa, now what? And he went back to the question, who am I? And we spent two years focusing on who he is other than his brilliant mind. So from those kids that I worked with at uni high up till today, it is about if you want to be, have congruence, have integrity, have authenticity, have uh, a happy a happy life, a contentful life, you must, you must live out of all five domains. You must, I say, recognize you have five because that's the first step. He didn't even think about it. Listen to all five. And that doesn't mean equally. He's going to, as an example, he's going to listen to his mind the most, obviously, and that there's no problem. But at least recognize and attend, check in to all five domains. Respect what each part of yourself is saying. Respect the messenger from within you. And the final step is to honor it with action, honor things, honor what you hear with action. So it's it's not a quick process, even just recognizing and listening, learning how to listen to the whole self, respecting one's whole self is a whole process. But I, I have yet, and I have tested this, I've seen over a thousand clients. So I have asked myself many hundreds of times when they come in with anxiety, existential depression, which is happening all the time now with highly gifted, very common, very common of all ages because of the world affairs, because of our national affairs and feeling helpless and hopeless in that situation. I ask myself, is it still important to focus on all of who they are? And every single time it is about balancing one's life and at least understanding that you have a wonderful mind, but you're more than your mind. So Patty, you made me think, I was actually watching the movie Jerry and Marge Go Large on TV the other night. And I don't know if you've seen it, um, but it's uh-huh. about no. a, it's based on a true story of a couple who the husband, he's retiring, uh, but he's brilliant at maths. Like he's he's clearly gifted um, and he looks at the state lottery and figures out a loophole in it. And so him and his uh-huh. wife become professional lottery players and they use that to help their community get back on its feet. It's a small community. Oh, okay. um, but in one part of the movie, uh, he turns around and says to his wife, this thing, this gift that I have of being able to see everything in mathematics he goes it's it's not always a gift it's a bit of a a curse and he describes a a thing he goes do you know why I don't like fishing anymore he said because one day I was out there fishing and I was so busy trying to calculate the current in the stream by the movement of my bobber I was so focused on that I heard the last sentence of what our son said to me and he was about 16 at the time he said so dad what do you think about that and he, re- he realised that his son had been talking about a problem he was having with a girl and he said, and I missed that. He said the, the focus on having this gift and the focus on the, li- the intellect has caused me to miss things and miss opportunities to connect with people. Um, and what you were saying about the whole 10,000 channels makes me think that it's easy to steer the direction of a horse when you're riding it, right? It, it's easy to guide that one horse 
But when you've got a pack or a herd of horses running at speed, it's hard enough to actually just keep up with them, let alone to try and direct them and to sort of instigate some change. So that sense of having to change how you think about yourself and having to try and focus on other areas of who you are and develop those must be actually quite a difficult and daunting prospect. And when you were saying, you know, some of those profoundly gifted kids don't like being directed, perhaps that's half of the challenge is that for them to change is so incredibly difficult. For them to try and control the horses is so hard. And that's why masking can be so exhausting because you're putting so much effort into controlling a whole herd of wild horses. Um, So do you find that that is a challenge in your work that, you're trying to get people from a space of intellect to focus on these other areas presents that challenge because that mind is just so runaway and so powerful. It, you know, it wants to focus on the bobber in the stream and it wants to calculate the mathematics. It's just drawn to that thing so powerfully um, that you've got to really work to pull that focus back onto something else. Very insightful. Thank you. That's right on. Um, I, I want to I want to let you know that as a psychologist, as a counselor, anybody who comes to my office is very courageous, and I know it. People that are highly and profoundly gifted are self-reliant. They're used to figuring every single thing out. They expect themselves at age two to figure it out, at age five to figure it out, to not go to the adult to ask for help, because they ought to be able to figure it out, to pull themselves up by the bootstraps. So when highly and profoundly gifted of any age comes into my office, I know that they're hurting, that the 8,000, 10,000 channels or Hubble telescope. See, remember, just like you just talked about the herd, the herd is the whole person. So they don't just have 10,000 channels here. They have a lot of emotional reaction, sensitivity, depending on, I'm going to possibly talk about emotional giftedness and how emotional they are. Some people are, some people aren't. That they absorb others' energy. Even environmentally, it's been proven that physiologically, they have many, many more allergies and sensitivities and awarenesses of electrical currents and all the things that are going on. Everything that's going on in the room, all their senses are more alive so that you have more sensual overexcitability in the sight, the sound. I mean, I mean, they can hear clocks, you know, down the hall. I don't even know exists, you know. So there's so much going on that what really happened, and along with what you just spoke of, which is their mind is very, very quick. So that, you know, another thing, another way to think of it is by the time you are highly gifted, you're like a jet plane. An average person would be taking a jog. A moderately person would be in a car. You know, when you're highly gifted, you're in a jet plane and then you're a rocket ship. Okay, when you're profoundly gifted. So there is so much so fast and usually energy goes with that, believe it or not, so that they're not lackadaisical when you when your mind is going to your energy is going to and that's why it's very common for them not to sleep as much, not to need as much sleep, have difficulty going to sleep because right. So what happens is. They're so used to, their mind has the greatest voice. It has the loudest voice. And it's gotten admired the most from the self and from others. And so they're used to listening to it. At the same time, their other parts of themselves are talking. They just aren't, either they're uncomfortable with it, they're scared of it sometimes, They feel at odds with it. That happens a lot. So what happens for me is I don't, I'm not a a jet plane like they are. I don't, I'm not a Hubble telescope, but I'm very, very deep emotionally and I'm very, very intuitive and I can feel physically, emotionally, spiritually. And so when I respond to them in that way, I, I reflect back, not just what they said, but what's going on, I ask, is this what's, do you feel like this? It helps them come back to that. But you are so right on that they they take care of their mind in a sense, or they pay attention to their mind, but not the rest of who they are. And they can get lost. 
And it can cause so many problems in relationships unintentionally, unintentionally, you know, they can very much in their, in their way, love their spouse or whomever, their child, but their mind is so active that it's, it's difficult to learn to focus other than that. And so we practice that, you know, and and that's where I'm very active in that process in developing a relationship with them Um, and in, in developing a place where they can feel very, very safe and very genuine and not mask. Like it's probably my, my, my hope, my goal would be uh, what Rogers calls the core conditions, that they would feel complete respect and acceptance for exactly who they are, that they could be genuinely who they are and that I could empathically understand them. And when I can offer that, that is fertile soil for growth because it allows them to be introspective. It allows, So here we go into Dabrowski right now. It allows from them to go just from the mental inside into their values, their ethics, how they've lived. Are they in congruence? Are they following others? What do they really believe inside if they could quiet their mind? What does their heart say? Um, what do they need? And I, I, I have a thing got again decades ago when I was given a presentation, I was asked, how can you help kids? Uh, What could you give them? I was working with fifth graders at the time to help them learn who they are and get out of depression, et cetera. And I came up with a list of questions that I've used, I've given to many, many people, many groups of people of all ages. And they, there's something like, um, what makes your heart sing? What brings you the greatest joy? What really matters to you? What do you really care about? What does the world really need? Who needs you? And how can you be of service? Because the ultimate, I have yet to meet one gifted, and I have been, I've worked with many thousands when you're, li- when you're listing the groups that I've worked with along with individuals and families, many, many thousand. I have yet to meet, and I ask audiences all the time, do any of you want to make a, or I'll say, what, tell me what it's like. What, what's one of your goals? Always, always. I've got to make a difference. I've got to do something. And being of service, even to the guy who I told you who said he was empty, was very, very important. He was of service to the world for his scientific you know, discoveries. So it's just, it's about me recognizing and honoring and respecting their wholeness and the complexity of that and how it's been muted and how to help them listen to their mind, but not be owned by their mind. That the mind is not God, in quotes, the mind is not the Almighty, that they have more information that will guide them if they can listen. And, uh, you know, as as I respond to those parts of them, they can respond to parts of them. So that's how it really works. I really want to ask you the question of how to support this population. And I, when I wrote the question to you in the run sheet for this episode, I was talking about therapists, you know, because there's just nothing. You were there at the Congress last summer, and you heard me say, like, one of the goals for the Dabrowski Center in our first couple years is going to be to bring together people who work with this population from the clinical perspective. And I'm going to include coaches, too, because although I'll keep them separate to some degree, because there's a different, it's different to be a coach than a therapist. But the fact is, There's no program that exists in the counseling or the social work, you know, or any of these professions that specializes in giftedness. It just, it doesn't exist. And so the only thing I can think of to do to rectify this is to reach out to people who do have experience like yourself and to somehow have a coalition where we work together and put on paper these are the best practices for working with this population. And ultimately, I think it has to include the differences between, like you said, the mildly, the moderately, the highly, and the profoundly gifted. But at the end of the day, people who work with this population need to know that they're different, that this is a legitimate, meaningful, psychological difference that they're experiencing, and approach them differently than they would a client who's not like them. And so no question, no question about that. And here's the danger, Chris, which you know all too well. Labeling. 
I tell people that my, my one of my greatest gifts is one of my one of my faults in some ways, and that is I I rarely diagnose. I mean, I can meaning pathology pathologize. I can I can help them understand if they want to know if they ask me specifically, but labeling can become a box for the person and for the provider. And uh, I, I just want to go back to the individuality. You know, I must hear, see, feel, intuit the person and the complexity of the person. I must embrace them. Now, I want to respond. I used to not only I was a professor before after I got my PhD, I was a professor and I was training psychologists. Right. And there are certain characteristics that I believe a, a therapist ought to have. and. It better be about self-growth. It better be about introspection. It better be, in my mind, about their own holistic well-being and how they walk the talk. Okay. I don't believe in techniques. I never have. I never will. It, they drive me nuts. Um, you have it inside. You have this depth of empathy and caring and understanding. And it's I, I can't imagine working with gifted if you're not gifted yourself. Um, I, I just feel like they, there's, there's from the inside out, the experience of the world, while it's similar and different as individuals are, there's a uniqueness. And uh, you must have a depth of experience in being able to really talk with, understand, and and deeply empathize, and there's levels of empathy. There's not one level of empathy. There's, there's an escalator that goes down. And in order to really get to the depth and the complexity of people and the uniqueness, you, you better be able to go there, okay? Now, having said that, I used to, I haven't for a while, and I've thought about doing this again, I used to I was the therapist for the therapist, right? I was the psychologist that other psychologists would see. And I did help them learn cleansing. And I want to I want to say this uh, to the audience and to you. In between every client that I have, I cleanse. Every single client. Why do I do that? Because I absorb. I use my whole self. I, I cleanse my head, I cleanse my body, I cleanse my energy field, I cleanse my emotion. I have an entire process and I teach others how to do it because otherwise our own thoughts can come in, something from something, something from our husband could come in. You know, I mean, it's like if I'm going to be fully attentive, I can't be carrying over the person before them or my own life and I need to be wholly present, okay? And a lot of very, very good therapists and counselors are empaths. I'm an empath. I didn't know what that was. I, how would I know what that was? I was a kid, you know, and I didn't know until I thought I had a brain tumor when I was getting my master's. So I went to the health center and they did CAT scans because I couldn't sleep at night. I was thinking about, I was then working with gifted on the street, gifted kids that are street kids. And I was walking the streets with them. And you better believe I was taking them home in my head, in my heart, in my soul, right? And so when the doctor said to me, you don't have anything physically wrong with you. You probably need to get into therapy, which I believe is essential for any psychologist that they should also be in therapy. They need to know what it's like to be in the other seat. If you haven't been in that other seat, you shouldn't be in the therapist seat. You better be in that seat. So you know what it feels like. You know that vulnerability. You know that self-discovery, that, that courage that it takes to look at oneself deeply. Um, and, and back then, like I said, holistic wasn't talked about and, and there, it just wasn't, I mean, Ram Dass was there, but I didn't particularly like Ram Dass at the time, but there was just, um, I just had to come up with a way. And so I did a guided meditation. I created one for myself and I, I healed myself and, uh, and I learned that now that I've done it a million times, probably plus. I can do it in split seconds, you know, because I know exactly how I can cleanse. But counselors 
who are open to this kind of complexity and this kind of depth and this kind of sensitivity and this different view and literally biological, physical, emotional, spiritual, different experience of nature and the world and what's going on. That's a lot to handle. And so um, not only is it about how to present the core conditions, how, but it's also about how to take care of oneself, how to how to make sure the healer, in quotes, the helper, the supporter, is healthy and whole. And believe me, I... I talk about this. I work with groups of kids. I go to school districts. They have me work with groups of kids. I I ask them, what do you want me to talk? What do you want to talk to me about? And they always say anxiety, depression, perfectionism. I'm having a hard time with friends. It's always those four. Always. I don't care where in the country they bring me. And, you know, I sit with them and I talk with them about, do you feel like this? Do Do you ever get told you're too much? You think too much? How many of you get told you think too much? How many of you get told you're too sensitive? How many of you feel real sentimental when you see that? How many of you, and I raise my hand with them, you know, because I'm one of them. And and we talk about that pain of the the pluses and the minuses, that giftedness is a two-sided coin, that there's, we don't want to trade in our mind. We don't want to trade in our sensitivity. We don't want to change uh, change our views or not see things. We love that expansiveness. But we are different and we feel different and people think we are different and they reject us. And I tell, I can share the stories of when I wasn't invited to the parties and when I cried and I was told I was too much. And I said, what do you mean I'm too much? What are you talking about? And what are you talking about? How would I know what that meant? Because you're normal, whoever you are, yet you're normal. So yes, that training therapist is a very, very significant thing. I worked with Anna Marie Roper on that, by the way. Um, we, we came up with a whole protocol. I, I even came up with her of a reading list to train therapists to work with gifted, highly and profoundly gifted when she was alive. This is a decade ago, at least now. Um, and we were going to be, we were going to train others how to really get to the inside out instead of the outside in, instead of just looking at performance, academics, just behaviors, you know, and, and I, I guess I want to say with regard, I just stumbled on behaviors. I want to say all behaviors are purposeful. Masking is purposeful. Being quiet is purposeful. Going in one's room is purposeful. Acting out, imploding, exploding, talking, not talking. Everything is purposeful. There's, there's something on the whole person that is creating this experience. And it's usually a defense mechanism. And I tell the kids, that's okay. We got to have defense mechanisms. (laughs) Don't feel bad about that. We got to have them. You know, we got to have them. One more thing just came to my mind that I want to say that's really uh, so essential to me. I think that we focus, myself included, all of us, every person, we focus so much on the outer world and how we interact with the world, whether it's our roles or our jobs, what we have to do with paying the bills, taking the dog for the walk. I mean, all the different ways that our world interacts with us. And and I, I, I share this in, in an imagery because it's how I saw it. I mean, I literally have visions of seeing things. And that's how, that's how I knew that it to be true because I was working with the person at the time that I saw it. When you think of three concentric circles, you see that outer circle of who you are and the world is around you and you're interacting. And then right underneath that is your stresses and your fears. It's the things we all have them. Every single person has them and we try to hide them. You know, we try to contain them. We don't want the world to see, Um, you know, we try to behave right and do the things and blah, 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 please others and all that kind of stuff. But there's stresses and fears. When you go one more loop in, you're talking about your family history and your history of life. So in school, friendships, lack thereof, being accepted, being bullied, having a best friend, mom understanding me, dad not understanding me, whatever, you know, all the different, I call it the good, the bad, the ugly, because we all have the good, the bad, the ugly, right? And that imprints us, but we're more than that. We are very much more than our mind. We are very much more than just how we demonstrate with the world, what we show the world. 
We're more than our stresses and fears, and we're even more than our history. And so my goal for me as an individual and as a therapist is to go to the next level, the inner core that I call the golden core. It's the unique gold light of the individual. It's you. It's it's only you. You know, these other ways are how you're similar to others and then your own stresses and what you fear about. But this is about your inner guidance system. This is about your meaning and purpose. This is about what really matters. And it is a journey, a life journey, I believe, to go from the outside, which we focus on so much 90% of the time, and take a journey to the inner core. And when you take that journey, it's not easy. It's very scary. And it's Dabrowski again, very much. It's looking in the mirror. It's owning who you are. It's seeing how you're failing. It's seeing how you're incongruent. And it's feeling this inner, inner, inner being go, you're more than that. This is right. This is what you know to be true. You might be behaving this way. This is what you know. This is who you really are. And that journey is a life long journey. You don't get there and you're there and yahoo, here I am. And now I get to live this happy, happy, happy life. But the goal is to go inside into the morals, ethics, the behaviors, the the love, the connectedness, the empathy, et cetera. Go inside and be kind and fair and loving to oneself and embrace and honor that golden core. And when you do that, You can go out in the world and that's when you get into higher level advance, like level four, right? And and oftentimes that can happen when you're young. I know some gifted people, highly gifted and profoundly that have done that when they're very young. They're missionaries. They already are of life. They're spiritually and emotionally gifted and they are missionaries. They're emissaries of life. Oftentimes it happens when you're a little older, when you've gone through some self-doubt, some crashing some confusion, some turmoil, some disillusionment with the outer world and the inner world, right? And you can develop and begin to be more authentically who you are. So uh, I just see that as an essential growth process. And I'm wrapping it back to the therapist. For the therapist, him or herself, or the coach, him or herself, if you want to be their companion with a light, You have to know that you have a light and that they have a light and it's innate. And your job is to help them find it, right? And to partner with them and support them in their discovery. Not to know what it is for them because you can't. You can't be the expert. You're not the expert of somebody else's life. They're the expert. And that's what they need to discover. So those are things when I think about therapists and training therapists and, and working with other counselors and psychologists to help them, to help all of us, everybody live, live this way, live holistically, live as much as possible, discovering our golden core and authentically from our golden core. Wow. Thank you. That was perfect. (laughs) That was great. Oh my gosh. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to share my truth and, and my journey, which is continual. I mean, I'm still learning a lot about myself and disappointed in myself sometimes. And, you know, having to make new choices. I, I, I will say that uh, that's a word I love is choice. And I tell myself that, you know, you can make a new choice. You can make a new choice right now. You don't have to make the same choice. I have to tell myself that because, you know, sometimes things become habits and they're not that great, you know? So um, I love, I, I think I'll end on just knowing that we always have choices. We always have I choices. I love that. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, both of you. <laughs> well, thank you. thank you. I mean, in choices, that's the third factor in action. You know, every time yeah. you cho- make a choice to be different, to act in a different yes. way, there you go. Right. That's right. Um, it's great because, like, there's so many connections to the theory and everything that you've been talking about, not only, you know, overexcitable and sensitive people, but, you know, having to work through all those concentric circles and disintegrate that to get to your authentic self. And as Chris said, you know, making choices and not only that being related to the third factor, but figuring out the what is more like you 
and then choosing to you know that that's yes. part of that that sorting process before you get to that third factor of right now I'm going to actually yes. act on that and so I, I guess yes. even though we haven't been using the terminology all the components to it are there and I can see how your experience and long knowledge of the theory is actually playing out in what you do um, which is fantastic to see and how I live <laughs> yeah. what I do more to the point live, yeah both. <laughs> walking the yeah. talk i hope to I, I try to let me say that i certainly try to be congruent <laughs> thank you so much thank, thank you thank you so much for being with us and thank you chris as well for being on the podcast too always a pleasure to talk to you it is always a pleasure thank you and thanks to our listeners we always appreciate you joining us on the podcast too and i hope you got as much out of this as i did Positive Disintegration Podcast is funded by the Dabrowski Centre. If you like what you've heard, please consider donating through the link in the show notes. And if you're listening to us on Apple or Spotify, give us a rating or leave a review. If you want to get in touch with us, you can email positivedisintegration.pod at gmail.com or find us on Twitter or Instagram. And until next time, keep walking the path to your authentic self.